Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. We've got a great episode here for you today, setting the stage a bit more for the Rose Bowl matchup that awaits out in Pasadena, California on January 2nd, the number eight Utah Utes. We'll get to know a little bit more about them on this show. Penn State has that chance for a signature win we talked about, picking up that 11th win, what that might mean to the program. Uh, we are heading over to Media Day on Friday at Beaver Stadium. It's a good opportunity for us to, to get back face-to-face -face with every uh, every coordinator on this staff, with James Franklin. We're going to hear from Athletic Director Patrick Kraft and a ton of Penn State players. Um, so we'll get into that matchup a little bit later here on the show. We'll talk about what's cooking in the recruiting and transfer portal world as well. But we begin with a return guest here on the podcast, and it's Jackson Smolik, uh, who joined us right after he committed in the summer. He has since gone through his senior season uh, at Dowling Catholic in West Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, first off, man, glad to have you back. I guess we had fun the first time, so I I'm happy to get you back on the podcast. Yeah, man, I'm excited for this. I'm excited. Well, you are just weeks away, and, and this is we were talking before we started recording. This is one of my favorite times of the year to have prospects on, the guys who are just about on that verge of making the transition from life at home to life on campus. Um, what is this next month going to look like for you before you get to that January enrollment? Uh, just just getting ready for uh, school, finishing my classes here in Iowa, getting my finals done. Uh, yeah, just finishing all that stuff up and then uh, packing up, getting the bags ready and moving out there January 4th. So it's going to be a quick turnaround here. Yeah, that's coming up fast. So two days after this team plays in the Rose Bowl, you're joining them. Mm -hmm, for sure. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, so so putting that in perspective, I, I guess, do you have some unfinished business at home, family stuff, friend stuff? I know it's a little bit bittersweet to kind of cut out from your senior class halfway through, but it's something you've been planning for in a, for a long time. How are you kind of, I guess, internalizing all these emotions? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just it's not fully sit in yet because, you know, it's it's, it's still about three weeks away. But I mean, that's that's a pretty quick time. But uh, it still hasn't sit in yet. But I'm still spending all the time I have with my buddies and my, and my family, you know, but I'm gonna have some of my family come out there and stay with me for a little bit. So I'll, it'll still kind of feel like kind of home over there. So I'm still kind of getting ready and used to that stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, it's going great right now. You got kind of a sneak peek, I guess, at what life is about to become for you this past weekend, making the trip uh, to campus for your official visit. A lot of the members of your class already got that out of the way in the summer. You were a late addition, kind of uh, relatively speaking. So what was the experience like for you? It's not often you make an official visit as a commit by yourself. Uh, yeah, it, it was a really fun visit. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. I mean, they, they treated me, they treated me very awesome. I mean, it was awesome to get over there and, and see everybody again just before, right before I go up there. So, you know, getting to see Coach Yurich, Yursich, getting to see Coach O'Brien, getting to see Coach Franklin, getting to see all those guys. And uh, and then talking to some of the other guys um, that just committed this this past week, you know, Vicky and uh, Mason Robinson. So that was, that was pretty uh, good to see those guys and kind of develop a relationship before they come up. Yeah, those couple of, of pickups this weekend, were you sensing that that was going to be the case? I mean, we, we got word publicly here Monday and then Tuesday that those two defensive ends came on board uh, with Joseph and Mason. We discussed that on our last episode. Did you feel like things were trending in that direction when you all parted ways in Happy Valley? I mean, for sure. It's hard not to uh, not to commit if you go on a visit here. I mean, it, they, they put on a great show when you come up here. I mean, they show you the academic side, they show you the football side, and they show you just like, you know, the family and the culture side of, of football. So I, I would have been surprised if they uh, if they didn't choose Penn State because Penn State feels like a home. Mason Robinson is a guy who for a while probably anticipated he might be chasing you around Big Ten football field someday, committed to another Big Ten school. Uh, but here he is going to join forces with you on campus next year. Uh, what kind of a, of a person is Penn State adding? Because we hear a lot of good things about this young man, and we really understood along the way how highly academics were valued in his process. I mean, yeah, he's he's a super terrific guy. I mean, I love I love talking to him, getting to know him, and so is uh, Joseph. Uh, I forgot how to pronounce his last name, but Mapoye is is where we're at right now with it. I hope that's correct. <laughs> he's a great guy. Both of those guys are super nice, sweet guys. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't see him trying to you know chase down somebody and then uh, get him on a football field because it, you know they seem just like such nice guys off the field. So I'm excited you know to have them come to the come to the team and you know get to know him and uh, develop a relationship. What's it like when, when you're on campus for an official visit and, and, and other guys are, are on campus and trying to get their perspective? And um, how do you kind of walk that line between, you know, hey, I would love to spend the next few years with you trying to win championships versus being pushy and being overly aggressive? Uh, yeah, there, there is a difference. I mean, you don't want to like, you know, bug them in and like, you know, 
try to get them onto this onto this train you know you want you want to you know get them used to it and uh try to you know get them on your side and kind of see the good things of it and and you know the things that sometimes some people might not like but you know there's not that much over at penn state but uh yeah now when, when it comes to this final stretch i mean we're, we're in the thick of it now we're a week out of the early signing period i know you're excited to put pen to paper but i know you're excited to add some new pieces and some new weapons to this thing uh cameron wallace is is one of those remaining running back targets that we've been talking about for a while is that a guy you have communication with i mean do you have kind of that list in front of you that you're making sure hey come come join us just making sure that 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 is that is an open kind of discussion in the final seven days of this cycle yeah, I know, you know, you're trying to get the guys right before, you know, signing day. So, I mean, you know, kind of keeping contact with some guys, seeing where what their direction is, when they're going to announce. So, yeah, I'm just trying to keep contact with some guys, get them on the train. All right, let's talk about uh, moving forward and, and what maybe this quarterback room might look like that you're going to encounter. What was your initial reaction to, to Christian Veyer announcing he was hitting the transfer portal? Uh, not necessarily surprising here on campus, but it certainly – impacts what your role might be come January and then ultimately come next fall. Yeah, I mean, it gives me an opportunity to compete even more. I mean, if, if he was there, I would have competed as much as I did. But, uh, yeah, it just kind of gives me, a, you know, another spot and you know, a little bit of leeway room to uh, to compete a little bit harder and uh, have a chance for that second spot and stuff like that. I mean, you know, just compete with the other quarterbacks and see how that thing goes. Did you get some time with those guys, some personal time while on campus, uh, whether it was Drew or or Bo and or Sean, who's who's not going to be around that room next year, but certainly is still around the facility? Yeah. So uh, when I was um, with Coach O'Brien in the uh, quarterback room, Drew came in, said hi, introduced himself, which is which is very nice of him. And then uh, Bo was my player host, and he showed me around campus and stuff like that. So yeah, it was great getting to know those guys and great kind of starting the relationship off of them. What stood out about Bo Prabula being that host? That means you guys were kind of joined at the hip for much of the weekend. You probably got a good feel for his personality. He is also a multi-time guest on the Lions 24-7 podcast, so you've got that in common. What stood out about him? Because because he's obviously a guy people are getting more familiar with in this QB group. Yeah, he's a super nice guy. He's a great leader. I mean, he he, he showed me around really well, and uh, I, I was glad to have him as my player host. And uh, he seems like a guy I'm going to get along with really well, so I'm excited to get up there and, and talk with those guys. The coach that is leading this group, of course, is Mike Yersich. You, you talked about getting the chance to get around with him. What stands out the more and more you get to pick his brain, he gets to pick your brain about the relationship that you two have developed in a relatively short amount of time? Yeah, I mean, he's a super smart guy. I mean, he, he knows the stuff when it comes to football, which which is awesome, which is good to know as a quarterback when you go into that film room. And uh, he he certainly knows what he's talking about when you get in there. And he a uh, very personable guy and uh, – yeah, we, we get along really well, and I'm, I'm excited. He's been called fiery by just about every player we've talked to about him, especially the quarterbacks. Is that something that you appreciate on the sideline, on the practice field? Because not necessarily every quarterback is going to respond to that kind of attitude and emotion uh, in, the, in the thick of action. Yeah, you you you, uh, you want a coach that that's gonna get on you a little bit if you mess up. You don't want a coach that's laid back and stuff, and you want a coach that's gonna you know correct your mistakes and get on you a little bit. That's that's what makes the great players so great. Any homework assigned by Mike Yursich over the course of your senior season? Just some challenges maybe that he put your way um, as he was able to evaluate. I know he's busy being the offensive coordinator for Penn State, but I know he's also invested in your future. What, what was that like? How involved was he in, in kind of monitoring your development as a senior, getting that season under your belt? Yeah, so so I, I didn't get too much time for him to you know give me some homework and stuff, but uh, I went up there and um, in the film room, and they kind of showed me how they run things and how, how they do their stuff. So he kind he didn't really give me homework necessarily, but he he showed me stuff and he was like, okay, yeah, keep keep this down because this is kind of what we do. And this year was big for you. We talked about it last time you were on the podcast and, and the missed opportunities as a junior because of an injury and your ability to bounce back and the elite eleven and all that stuff leading up to your path to Penn State. But you were on the field. You were an all-state quarterback. How did it feel to be in control of that offense from start to finish? Uh, it felt great. It felt great to have a full season under my belt. I mean, that's that's one of the things I've always wanted. And uh, and I got it, and uh, I performed well, and I got the chance to lead my team and kind of show my leadership as a quarterback and as a, as a person. And th this team this year was really close with each other, and uh, I feel like me and my teammates and the other captains, we led this team really well. And uh, I, was, I was really uh, thankful for my opportunity. The Penn State coaching staff clearly liked you a lot before your senior season, but do you think coming out of your senior year, 
you're a different quarterback of a different mindset I, 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 in, in terms of gaining some traits from finally playing a full slate of games? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like I've matured in the uh, in the reads and the scene defensive wise. Everything's you know slowing down a little bit more game by game, and uh, I feel like this senior season's really kind of leveled me up as a as a quarterback. How engaged have you been with the other commits? Um, you know, many of them have, have been part of this class for well over a year or or several months before you were on board. How was your acclimation into this group? Because you were so still fresh uh, off that commitment last time we had you. Yeah, so uh, I've gotten to know all the guys pretty well. Some of the, a lot of the guys were on an unofficial when they when they came over here, so I got to talk to them and get to know them a little bit better. And uh, I'm also you know keeping in contact with them on on uh, social media. So yeah, we're, we're we're developing really good relationship. What do you think about that offensive line unit? It looks like it could be one of the best in the country right now with those three guys. I know they'll be joining you in January, getting a head start. This offensive line group in general is coming off a strong year at Penn State, but how do you feel about having those big fellas in this class with you? It's really relieving seeing those seeing those big guys when I go on visits and they're you know three, four, five inches taller than me. So it's uh, it's really re relieving to see those guys are going to be protecting me in the future. What are your thoughts on uh, a guy that you want to play fetch with, I'm sure, in the future, and 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 Carmelo Taylor uh, joining this class in Virginia? He's another guy who kind of had that late rising recruitment story of a different variety than you, but nonetheless ends up with a Penn State offer and a commitment to this class. Uh, have you had a chance to check out that tape? Because it's a fun watch. Oh, yeah, I've seen him. I mean, he, he's electric on the field, and uh, I'm excited to be able to connect with him. Anything else stand out? I mean, about this group, Angel Rapelier is, is a guy who we've talked to on the podcast. His film looks really impressive. I'm just curious, kind of, when you get a chance to, to peruse the group, and, and this isn't you saying that, uh, that the other guys aren't great, but anyone else that you're really excited to get to work with because of maybe a connection you've made or just simply watching their senior season film? I mean, the, the, those two tight ends coming in, those guys are special. They're big. I mean, they're, they're great catchers, and uh, I'm excited to connect with them a little bit. And, you know, the offensive line, excited for them to protect me. And same with uh, Camrello and all those guys, London Montgomery, and you know, all those guys. We're going to be a special class this year. You are following up a freshman group in 2022 that burned 10 red shirts. That's a really big number. James Franklin has been telling us since the spring that this group was going to do big things. What's your early read on your class? Uh, you guys have a lot of progress to make before we see you on the field this spring. But what kind of a sense do you have for the early enrollees and what you might be able to accomplish? Yeah, I feel like we're going to be a really special class, you know, seeing these guys, seeing how we connect as a class. And uh, I'm really excited to get out there and be able to connect with them more, you know, through workouts, go through adversity with them. So, I mean, it all kind of, you know, depends when you get up there, how, how people deal with adversity. But I'm really confident in this group. What's on the top of your to-do list between now and enrollment to, one, enjoy these last few weeks back home, and two, to make sure that you show up to Penn State and you're not behind in any kind of way? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm just going to stick with throwing and, you know, kind of try to, you know, increase arm, arm, uh, arm speed, you know, kind of crisp up the motions a little bit before I get up there. And uh, obviously, you know, try to get a lot of strength built up before I get up there because college football is a lot different than high school football, obviously. And, uh, you know, trying to put some pounds on before I get up there as well. So I was going to ask you, you're talking about strength building. Usually that means adding some weight. Where are you right now uh, stepping on the scale? And where do you think maybe is going to be a good spot for you to settle in as you become that college quarterback? Uh, right now, I'm I'm weighing in around 205 is is the is the latest I have, and uh, I want I want to get at least 215 before I get up there, and uh, I'd like to play it around 215, 220. That'd be nice. Uh, did you get a chance to watch a lot of Penn State football? I don't know how many of your games were on Fridays versus Saturdays. Was it like appointment viewing for you and your family? Oh yeah, we we watched about every game there was. What stood out to you? Because when you committed to this program, a lot of us were wondering what was the product going to look like on the field for Penn State. They're looking for an 11th win in the Rose Bowl. So obviously they got to a pretty good spot. But we saw this offense in particular evolve significantly with those freshman running backs and the offensive line, a big part of that. What were your top takeaways watching this team? Yeah, watching this team, they, they, they were special this year. I mean, there's something different. You know, Nick Singleton, Katron Allen, Sean Clifford did great as well. And uh, tight ends, tight ends were doing awesome this year. They're 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 big guys this year. O-line was really doing well. But it, it was just a fun to watch them play and watch them really go out there on the field and do their thing. And then uh, I guess looking ahead here, um, do you know who your roommate will be? How are you getting started? Yeah, I'm going to have Joey uh, Schlaff. I can't pronounce his last name. You got to figure it out before you guys get together in that room. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> 
and he's a high school quarterback. I, I'm sure you're aware of that he's, you know, he's spent, he spent a lot of time playing quarterback, make that transition to tight end. Um, and, and you'll get to campus and, and are there uh, academic plans for you right off the bat? Are you going in on decided or do you kind of have that narrow focus on a degree already? Uh, I'm going in undecided right now. I just, I don't know what I want to do. It's in between a, a lot of things right now. Cause you know, I just, I just, I just, yeah, I'm undecided. I don't really know what I want to do yet. And, and back home, you're, you're leaving, I'm sure a very strong support system. I think we all got to know a little bit more about that reading and learning about your story and some of the adversity you went through and the people who hung with you. Uh, who are you going to miss? I mean, what, what who, who do you want to kind of uh, send some love out to? I'm, I'm sure you have some, some folks back home going to be tuning into this episode. Oh, for sure. all my teammates, for sure. I mean, those guys made my, my my season awesome. They made my season unforgettable, my senior season. All my coaches, Coach Meese, Coach McLean, Coach Wilson, Coach Coach Smith, Coach Jack. Oh, I mean, all those coaches, Coach Campbell. I don't want to forget anybody. Coach Pollock, uh, all, all those coaches, Perry, uh, everybody. Everybody on the coaching staff was awesome and great to me, and they really helped me in my development as a, as a player and, and a, and a uh, person. And then the last one for you here, um, you know, I always mention this, there, there's a good chance we won't talk to you as a true freshman for basically a full year once you get to campus. So open mic right now, what's the message out to, to Nittany Lions Nation about what you're bringing to this program, what your class is bringing to this program and what you're all about? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to bring toughness to the table and, uh, you know, bring leadership over there. And there's already leadership there, but, you know, bring more out onto the table and uh, and really kind of help out with anything, you know, being team first player, you know, worrying about the team, not yourself. And uh, I feel this class can be something special. We're going to bring adversity. We're going to bring hard work. We're going to bring, we're going to bring everything on the table. So I'm, I'm excited to get up there and compete with, uh, with everybody and all through the workouts. And I, I already know my class is really excited to get up there and, uh, and compete. Jackson, it's easy to sense your excitement. We'll see you around town here in just a few weeks. Enjoy the, the rest of your time back home. And thanks for coming back on the Lions 24 seven podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's bring attention back to the upcoming Rose Bowl matchup with number eight, Utah, January 2nd out in Pasadena, California. As we've covered a few times here on the podcast, myself, Mark Brennan, Daniel Gallen, Grace Brennan, all will be live on location for all the bowl practices, all the media availability. It should be a great opportunity to provide everyone with excellent coverage. We'll come to you with some podcasts from there. It'll also be a chance to get to know more about this Utah team that finished the season on such a high note. Uh, looking to get to uh, get back for another Rose Bowl visit. So we have some perspective uh, from Steve Bartle right now, who was out in Pasadena last year, watched a fantastic matchup between the Utes and Ohio State. And, and now he'll get to see Utah again, go up against the Big Ten team. And Steve, we are going to learn a lot, I think, in this conversation about number eight Utah. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for having me on, Tyler. I definitely appreciate it. It's going to be a fun one. I think this matchup really just... I haven't done a deep dive on Penn State yet, but obviously, you know, everybody knows Penn State and and uh, has has watched them over the course of the season for sure. And so uh, just in my in my little understanding of the program, like in a lot of ways, these these two programs are pretty similar and how they find success and, and, and that kind of stuff. So um, should be pretty fun, man. I'm excited for this conversation and excited to be here, man. Well, uh, just to put it out there, I don't know if I mentioned, Steve's part of this 24-7 uh, sports network, Steve Bartle covering for uh, Utah for the Ute Zone uh, within this 24-7 sports uh, team. And, and we'll get a chance to catch up with you live and in person out in, in Southern California in a few weeks. But let's set the stage a little bit and let's address the elephant in the room here when it comes to this time of year in college football, the opt-outs. If you're not in the college yeah. football playoff, who are you actually bringing to the party for some of these, uh, you know, high caliber bowl games that have lost some of that luster. Can you talk us through where things stand for Utah and how that might impact things? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, looking at this roster, you know, there's been three players that have essentially declared for the NFL draft. And so two of them um, first is Clark Phillips, unanimous all American cornerback um, has declared for the NFL draft. And this is really one of those this is this is the the tr the true definition of an opt out where he's you know opting out of the game to protect his draft stock and you know that's totally understandable and i think everybody kind of every youth fan kind of understands like yeah he's he's doing what's best for him so utah's not going to be with their their top cornerback top playmaker um six interceptions on the year i think he finished the year with two pick sixes um was the guy usually responsible for uh, the opponent's best wide receiver. And so, 
you know, this season that meant a lot of, of guys like Jordan Addison at USC um, uh, and, and others of, of that caliber. So, you know, a lot of that and, and with Clark, it's tough, tough uh, for Utah. He's a big talent, um, but Utah is going to be good. They've, they've rotated, uh, they've rotated a lot of cornerbacks uh, throughout the season. They've had three with over 400 snaps. So, They'll uh, they'll be in, in pretty good shape still at cornerback position. Look for guys like Samaya Vaughn and, and to Travis Broughton to uh, be the guys at cornerback for Utah, both, again, uh, over 400 snaps. So Clark Phillips was one. Um, another one was Tavion Thomas, star running back, coming into the season. Didn't really have the year that many thought and expected from him. And, you know, there were a number of contributing factors, but he uh, he suffered an apparent toe injury uh, the week of uh, the final game and um, and essentially just decided to opt out of the rest of the season. So he wasn't there for Utah against Colorado and wasn't there uh, with the team for the Pac-12 title game. So he's been focused on his draft preparations and um, Utah has a pretty good stable of running back. So they'll be in good shape there. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that as, uh, as we continue. Uh, the last one is Dalton Kincaid star tight end for Utah. Um, He's been everything for this Utah offense. 890 yards, receiving eight touchdowns, uh, was the guy against USC on October 15th. Uh, 16 catches, 234 yards, and a tutty. So, um, you know, he's he's going to be a big presence. I think this one, this one for Dalton, this is more an injury is holding him out, and rather than a pure opt out. If he were healthy, he would absolutely go. So, you know, he suffered a, a back injury against Colorado. Um, and tried to give everything he had for this, everything he had left for Utah in the Pac-12 title game, which he did, uh, had four receptions, but clearly just not himself. So he's opted out due to health reasons, um, but if he were healthy, he would be good to go. And, and again, uh, much like the other positions, Utah has good depth there where they can, they can, you know, they'll, they'll find some guys to fill in. And maybe it won't be the same, obviously, but they'll have guys to fill in and, and make plays for them. Yeah, and certainly to replace a 70 reception tight end. I mean, yeah, it's not really an, an easy task for anyone. And that's right. 20 more catches than anyone on this roster for Utah. Eight, 890 receiving yards, eight touchdowns on the season. Those all led the Utes here during the season. So, look, both teams are without their leading receiver. Parker Washington was injured in November. He's not available. He's already turned attention to the NFL draft. Uh, Joey Porter Jr., you know, him and Phillips are going to be vying for, for opportunities in the NFL as high caliber prospects now. And they're not involved in the Rose Bowl conversation. Uh, but you pointed to something there that Utah's uh, running back stepping aside. And uh, so it leads me to, to, to put even more on the shoulders of Cameron Rising. He's answered that bell a bit the last couple of games, um, has had a bit of an up and down career at times. But where is he right now? Heading into the Rose Bowl, feels like he's carrying a lot of confidence, a lot of momentum. Yeah, for Cam, you know, was having a tremendous season um, up to that USC game on October 15th. Uh, and that was really where, you know, he had over 400 yards uh, passing, multiple touchdowns. He scored the final touchdown and two point conversion to seal the victory for Utah on that one. That was really like when you look at Cam's uh, career, is two se- the past two seasons, that's really his. You know, his marquee performance, that's where you start the conversation with him now. So that was, you know, big for him. But in that same game, you know, late in that game is he suffered a knee injury. And so that has cost him. Um, that cost him a game uh, against Washington State. He was a game time decision um, for that one and ultimately decided, I think, about 20, 30 minutes prior to kickoff that he just wasn't able to give it a go. And and so he missed that game. And in the ensuing games um, was clearly just not himself. Uh, You could see it. He wasn't as mobile, uh, wasn't able to drive throws uh, with velocity. Um, He suffered a knee injury to his, his left leg, his plant leg. So when you're, he's driving forward, that plant leg was just, you know, I assume a little unstable, Uh, but you know, he's bounced back. I think that Oregon game on November 20th was, uh, the bottom for him, you know, that's where things just kind of <laughs> bottomed out for him. And and he had a good bounce back performance the next week against Colorado and then again against USC. So he's, you know, he's had an up and down year. Uh, and and the big part of that, again, is the injury. Uh, the injury 
cost him some. And and it, it, as we get closer to the Rose Bowl, you know, we're now getting two months removed from when that injury occurred. And so he should be in, in great shape, as, as good a shape as he can be. And he's trending upwards with his play over the last two games. Uh, so, you know, fully expect Cam to be good to go and uh, and performing at a, at a great level. And like we saw last year, Cam was instrumental and huge for Utah uh, in, in one of the most uh, entertaining games of both of the bowl season last year and uh, over the last few years. So he'll be, he'll be in good shape. And, you know, what's interesting with Cam is he doesn't have the gaudy numbers, um, but in their big games, Cam usually shows up in, in a big way. So that's something that Utah is going to be counting on from him uh, with this Penn state matchup on January 2nd. You mentioned the clunker against Oregon, uh, three yeah. interceptions, no touchdowns. But since then, uh, six touchdowns through the air, no interceptions. Uh, and, and here they are in the Rose Bowl once again as Pac-12 champions uh, repeating. I mean, there's a lot to look at big picture for, for what this matchup means for Utah. But I want to focus on just a couple of things here offensively with Cameron Rising and with this team. Uh, Tav- Tavion Thomas and Dalton Kincaid combined for 15 touchdowns this season for Utah they're not in that equation anymore so where are those touches where are the playmakers going to kind of pop up from against Penn State I think let's let's start with the running game first so obviously Tavion Thomas opting out he was a touchdown machine um, last year for Utah he scored over 20 touchdowns in that 2021 season wasn't as productive again this this year Um, number of factors outside of football contributing to that so it's you know, it was kind of just that element has been missing all all season long for Utah. That that reliable bell cow that could get you some explosive yardage here and there. And what's happened since Tavion Thomas declared is the emergence of Jaquinta Jackson, the former four star uh, dual threat quarterback, committed to Texas um, out of high school, uh, tremendous athlete, and transferred to Utah after his his first year at Texas. And, you know, was in the quarterback competition uh, in fall camp. It was quarterback, came out of of fall camp, quarterback three. And they moved him to running back in week four of the season. And the progress that he's made since that move has just been, it's been remarkable. And so what's happened over the last two games, again, Colorado and USC, he's gone for over 100 yards rushing with big explosive runs in each of those games. I think he's, I think they were, I think he's had two 50-yard runs in each of those games. And even before that, um, he had another big explosive run against Arizona. So he's become sort of that bell cow, uh, but also a source of big explosive yardage. He's averaging uh, nearly seven yards a carry right now. Um, and again, it's just he's got that athleticism. He's got the build at six two, 230 pounds, still probably running 4'6", four, 4'5", four, somewhere in there. He's a tremendous athlete. So they've got him going, and he's he's accounted for I think five touchdowns over the last over the last two games. So he's become that source of of production for Utah in the run game. Um, in the throw game, obviously Dalton Kincaid. It's going to be tough to find someone to fill his shoes with the amount of production uh, that he that he was responsible for with how how clean he was, how good he was at just you know being reliable. Uh, a reliable option for Cameron Rising. But the guy that Utah is going to turn to is actually wide receiver Devon Vele, who was the number two wide receiver this year, uh, had close to 600 yards and really kind of emerged um, as as a good, reliable threat on the outside where he could uh, create separation in the short timing routes, but also get vertical. He's a big body, a big basketball player at 6'5", 205 pounds, um, you know, played shooting guard, uh, so he's got that athleticism and got that ability to go up and, 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 you know, make those contested catches, those jump ball situations. So the, that's going to be another, uh, that's going to be a player that Utah turns to, but then also um, a guy that's emerged over the last three, four weeks has been money parks, uh, uh, a talented receiver out of Texas. He's been with the program a few years. Um, he's kind of a versatile piece where he can play inside and out kind of that explosive athlete at 5'11", 175 pounds, um, had the big play against USC for about 53 yards that gave them the go-ahead touchdown in the third quarter. Um, He's he's accounted for 400 yards this season, and he's kind of the big play. He's averaging over 
uh, 16 yards a catch. So he'll be another piece that Cam Rising in the passing game that you know they're going to rely on uh, as they look to move on from as they look for production without Dalton Kincaid in there. So again, just to Quentin Jackson in the run game, and then you've got Devon Bailey, Money Parks as receiver uh, in the passing game. Money Parks to me is just the ultimate receiver name. You got to love that. Uh, if we could shift gears over to the defensive side of the football for Utah, what are their calling cards defensively for that unit? And and who are the game wreckers? We know Phillips is no longer part of that group, but who are the guys that could spell disaster for Sean Clifford and Penn State out in Pasadena? Yeah, when talking about this Utah defense, it starts with the, the priority, first and foremost, is stopping the run. That's Kyle Whittingham's M.O., uh, for as long as he's been a coach at Utah. And he's been a coach at Utah for a really long time. So, you know, stopping the run is the priority for him. And, you know, that's really been the big difference for this defensive unit. Um, you know, if you had followed Utah at all this season, you know, you, you know that they played Florida in the season opener this year. And Florida and essentially ran all over them. Uh, I think they ran for over 300 yards in that game, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was a lot. Uh, and Utah continued to struggle defending the run um, early on that season. But they settled in. They found the personnel that was going to to help them best defend the run, to better defend the run, uh, and that's been the emergence of guys like defensive tackle Samote Peppa, uh, the progression of another defensive tackle on Aliki Vamahi. Those two have been instrumental in Utah's imp improvement against the run. Um, it's just brought a lot of stability, a lot of, uh, cleaner play, um, for Utah on this four, two, five defense, which is really designed to protect linebackers, to keep them free, to make plays in space. And so you've got to have those defensive tackles that are able to, you know, eat up, eat up those blocks, be responsible, but still make plays when they're there. And that's kind of been the key for Utah is the emergence of those two defensive tackles. I mentioned still have star defensive tackle, junior Tafuna, who's, you know, he's more uh, – he's equally as good against the pass and run. Um, and so those three are really the key to everything. Um, so priority is stopping the run, and that's been the big difference for Utah. They are, they're now the number one rush defense in the Pac-12, one of the top rush defenses, you know, in, in the country. And that's been the key here is they've, they've been better against the run. They've made teams more one-dimensional and – and that's allowed some guys to emerge as playmakers. So, um, you know, for Utah, you're talking about linebackers like Kareni Reed and Mahmoud Diabate, uh, as well as true freshman Lander Barton. Those guys have really kind of come on uh, as this latter half of the season. Those guys have really come on. They've settled into their roles. They're both, they're all new. Utah had to replace star linebackers, Devin Lloyd and Nephi Sewell, who had been manning the, the linebacker position for a couple of years those guys were all new to the position, new to starting. Um, and so it's been a work in progress for them, but they've really settled in uh, down the, the final month of the season. So that's been the key, has been the improvement against the run. But Utah's secondary, um, even without Clark Phillips, you know, as I mentioned, they've rotated guys in the secondary, you know, not only at cornerback, but at safety as well. And so, you know, you're going to see a secondary that includes, like I mentioned, Zamaya Vaughn. 6'2", 180 180-pound, lanky type of a cornerback, was really good uh, at, at utilizing his length. I think he finished the season with eight pass breakups, um, limited teams to about 50% completion percentage on targets his way, which I think was – I think he allowed four, tw 21 receptions on 42 targets. So, um, you know, he's kind of proven himself. Travis Broughton, uh, the other guy, has allowed roughly – 60% uh, of, of targets his way for reception. So, you know, they've got reliable options there at cornerback, but at safety, uh, Cole Bishop, RJ Hubert, and, and Sione Vaki are names to, to pay attention to. That safety position is really good and really been the key to, um, you know, a lot of playmaking at Utah on the defense side of the ball. They're utilized in the run game. They'll make tackles at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage. They'll be utilized in blitzes. Uh, they do a lot with that safety position. And so those are the guys to really pay attention to is, is Cole Bishop, Sione Vaki. RJ Hubert will be the free safety. Um, and so he's he's pretty reliable in deep coverage. But that's kind of the, the key is Utah's improved against the run. They've always been 
pretty solid against the, the, the pass game uh, this year uh, in, in pass defense, uh, but they've grown together. This is still a pretty young group that is, has just progressed and grown together. So uh, those are the guys. And then uh, at, at, as pass rush, I didn't even talk about the pass rush, but defensive end, Utah is going to rotate a number of guys, Gabe Reed, Jonah Ellis, Connor O'Toole. Those will be the guys coming off the edge for Utah that are really good at generating pressure on the quarterback. And we'll get after, you know, Sean Clifford and, and, and the, the Penn state passing game. I'll finish up with a big picture focus here. I, I was a junior in high school when, when Utah and eventual number one pick Alex Smith had that on beat and run under urban Meyer in 2004, he moves on. We know that urban Meyer's career has gone this way, that way, the other way. It's been the same guy, his replacement, Kyle yeah. Whittingham, at Utah since 2005. It's a pretty remarkable span in this era of college football, the transition from the Mountain West Conference to the Pac-12 Conference. Here they are within a conference that is changing in a big way, as we know here in Big Ten territory, uh, but back-to-back -back conference yeah. titles. What is the significance of this matchup for, for Utah? Because it feels like there's some su substantial significance for this to Penn State, and there's not a lot of bowl games where it seems that way anymore. Yeah, no, that's such a great point is, you know, this Rose Bowl game is still meaningful and still has um, that the cachet to kind of, you know, it's an NY6 bowl. It's going to be in, in the playoff in a few years. But it's still, it, you know, when you talk about the Rose Bowl, everybody kind of, you know, they, they talk about it with reverence. So it's still, you know, it's still got that. And so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be valuable for either team. Right. And I think for Utah, but talking about Kyle Whittingham, you know, as you mentioned, he took over after urban Meyer and that Fiesta bowl run. Um, he helped Utah to an undefeated season in 2007 um, where they eventually, they knocked off Alabama in the sugar bowl, Nick Saban uh, head coach at the time still was still, I think still new, fairly new to Alabama at that time. But I mean, you beat Nick Saban in, in the sugar bowl in, in Louisiana, that's a big deal. So um, that was kind of the key for Utah and, and getting invited, making that leap to power five football when they were um, invited to the PAC 12 <laughs> and the transition from the group of five to the power five Kyle Whittingham has talked about it throughout his career. It's, arguably the most difficult trend thing that he's had to go through as a coach is getting this team to a level that they could, they could compete at the power five level true and truly compete, right? The goal is always to win the conference championship. And it took Kyle Whittingham four years, essentially from the time that they were invited to the time that they got a full roster of power five players. Uh, once he got that fourth recruiting cycle, it's been a it's been winning seasons ever since, and that was in, that was in 2014 when things started to finally click for Utah. Since that 2014 season, I think he's helped and guided Utah to a 78 and 32 record, somewhere along there, something something along that uh, along those lines. Uh, but he's been he's been remar you know just huge instrumental for Utah in, in their rise, especially over the last four years. So they've won the back to back. Pac-12 titles, but they've made it to four uh, four Pac-12 championship games in total over the last five years. They lost the first two uh, title games, uh, but they've won the last two. And this last one, I think for a lot of the guys, was uh, was really um, quite a bit sweeter. I think last year, it just kind of felt like destiny. A lot of those the guys kind of talk about that. Um, it was just kind of their year. This one, they actually had to go out and really – you know, they had to go out and earn it, you know, with USC and Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams, um, you know, the, all of the talk revolved around them and rightfully so it's a good, it's a great program, a lot of talent, Heisman winner. Uh, and so Utah really had to go out there and, and earn that one. And, and they did by the tune of 47 to 24 score. And so, you know, that one was a little bit more gratifying for the program. And I think for them, it's really cemented what they've accomplished over the last five, six years. It cemented their status as, you know, a program on the rise, a program that's now knocking on the door of their first top 20 recruiting class ever, top 25 recruiting class ever. Like that's the thing about Utah is their best recruiting class to date has been the 30th ranked class in 2020. So it's a program that, you know, it's, it, it doesn't get 
a lot of blue chip prospects. This is a program that develops and they've increased talent over the years. Uh, but now they're this, this second PAC 12 title, this Rose bowl game has really kind of cemented their status and really kind of solidified the message to a lot of recruits uh, where they're now in position to capitalize on the recruiting trail. And just, you know, from a big picture, Kyle Whittingham getting close to the end of his career, you know, he may have a couple years left. He doesn't, he always talks about him not being a lifer uh, as a coach. You know, he's got a family, he's got grandkids that he wants to spend time with. Um, you know, this run has been, has been everything to his legacy as well. And so, you know, for him, it's a great opportunity to add that Rose Bowl. Um, and, you know, from there, we'll see what happens. But this Rose Bowl game will be, uh, will be huge for Utah. Um, regardless of the outcome, you know, they're, they're excited to be back, excited to play a great program like Penn State. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a big one for Utah. Steve, really appreciate it. Detailed job of setting the stage for where things stand from Utah's perspective as we work our way toward Pasadena. Catch up with you in person out there. Maybe yeah. get you back on the pod for some late updates. Uh, we're all standing by for the potential of more opt-outs, I know. Uh, but, hey, uh, enjoy your post uh, postseason coverage. And you're dealing with snow. We're dealing with snow. <laughs> Keep that in your mind. Los Angeles is coming. So take care, man. Appreciate it, Tyler. Thank you so much. Yep. All right, we're going to shift gears once again uh, and finish off with a final segment here on the podcast. Bring back in our friend Tyler Calvarizo, who has done a tremendous job tracking all things during the final stretch of the recruiting cycle here as 2023 prospects work their way towards the early signing period. That begins on Wednesday, of course. This is all combining with the mega transfer portal event that uh, unfolded last Monday and has carried into another week. So Tyler, appreciate all the heavy lifting you've done behind the scenes at lions 247com Second appearance of the podcast. We can't let you stay away from, from these episodes much these days. No, it's like there's a 48 hour hold on me, man. Tuesday, Thursday, well, I'm always here. <laughs> Stand by. Um, so Tyler, when we look at the wide receiver transfer portal situation, it feels like it, it is something that you've got to keep tabs on day to day. Folks who have followed your morning tidbits up on the site, I think are getting a bit of whiplash. And I think that's very indicative of where college football is right now and the way the transfer portal and those interactions are needing to be monitored on a minute by minute basis, it feels. You know, we always talk about how fluid high school recruiting is. I feel like the transfer portal is even more fluid. There are just so many more factors at play, so many more things going on behind the scenes. It's a wild, it's the wild, wild west, man. That's the world we live in now. And with the wide receivers, you know, Penn State went in home with Caden Prather and Dante Thornton, and it looked like both might be getting the campus this weekend. Not sure that's going to happen at this point. Prather's heading to Maryland for an official, and Thornton's going to be at Miami for an official. Now, I've heard there might have been a little bit of an attempt from Penn State to kind of reshuffle and kind of just get them on campus before those official visits took place. I don't know if that's going to happen. What I will say is the staff is going in home with Dante Cephas today, and that's one they want to wrap up. They feel really good about him. They're in a good place there. And, you know, again, we talk about things going on behind the scenes. That's another recruitment where there are some things that need to be sorted out. But I think that Penn State has put itself in a position to close on a guy that it really likes. And, you know, I can't forget the other Kent State receiver that Penn State is involved with. We haven't really done a lot of talking about him, but Devontae Walker, who really burst onto the scene for Kent State this season, kind of in a Cephas-esque way, the way Cephas did in 2021. He really broke out for those golden flashes this past season. He entered the portal, has had a lot of suitors. Penn State's going to check in on him. And, hey, look, man, if Penn State winds up with the do with the Cephas and Walker duo after what they did at Kent State last season, I don't think anyone could be complaining about that. I think that's a pretty solid situation for all parties involved. Kent State to Penn State pipeline. We'll, yeah. we'll see what happens there. Well, I think there's a natural inclination for a lot of Nittany Lions fans to re recall not that long ago when Penn State was after – Thornton and, and after Prather and these guys were highly billed by 24 seven sports and they had a lot of power five offers and Thornton's case spent significant time committed to this program. You look at the body of work to this point and, and look at bringing in a wide receiver who's ready to help you win a big 10 championship in 2023 with a inexperienced quarterback and, and a guy who's going to be able to be an accountable presence there. It's hard not to lean towards Cephas as kind of fitting that solution. Thornton, Prather, they're going to bring that ceiling that's still in place. They're a couple of years removed from us talking about them being highly touted prospects. They're still highly touted prospects. And But I think to this point, 
what this team needs in 2023. You can't sneeze at getting Dante Cephas if that is the ultimate result here. Again, nothing's finalized there to this point. No, you can't sneeze at that at all. I mean, just go look at the film and go look at his production over the last two seasons. You know, I, I understand that he's playing at a group of five program, and I understand that there's a big difference between going up against a group of five defensive backs versus big 10 defensive backs on a weekly basis. But we're talking about a player who plays bigger than he is. His, his tape, I mean, he just makes play. It's every single time that you go watch Dante Sivas play, he's getting the best of a defensive back one way or another, whether he's winning off the line of scrimmage, he's winning a jump ball downfield. He's just one of those guys who has that it factor. You know, he reminds me a lot of Mitchell Tinsley just in the sense that he's a guy who's going to go out and make plays no matter really at what it takes at all costs. He's going to go out there and get the job done. That's what I see out of his tapes. I'm not, you can't sneeze at, at the idea of bringing him at all. He, I think he's a player who could pretty clearly produce at this level. We are seeing these transfer portal players reverse course, pivot their visit plans yeah. so quickly now. I mean, they're, they're, they're announcing on Monday that they'll be at one school uh, this weekend. By Wednesday, they've got a different airline, uh, a different flight book, a different destination. Colorado is a popular destination yeah. this weekend, as, as we have talked about quite a bit. But how, I guess, m much is there some anxiety on the part of Penn State at this stage of the process and feeling that you need to get this things done, get to that finish line uh, and, and not allow this process to play out because of the dead periods that are going to come up and just because of the opportunities that, that guys might encounter elsewhere? Uh, how much of it uh, is an emphasis to get this done in the next week, in the next few days, You know, kind of coinciding with the signing period? Yeah, I, I, you bring up the dead period, and that's a great point because this weekend is really the last time that they could get these guys on campus within that transfer portal window with the signing period coming up and everything like that. So, yeah, it, it's pertinent, I would say, especially with guys like Cephas where they're going in home and they're trying to lock that down. I, this is something the staff wants to get done for a bunch of reasons. One, obviously, you just want to get talent on board, and then you want to get that talent on board, and then you want to keep building. And how is that, you know, you get the ins and outs of how that talent fits. You get into the really nitty gritty of it once they actually get here. So the sooner the better in that regard, because you still got Rose Bowl prep, but at the same time, you do have an eye on next season, what's going to be going down next season. And these guys are going to be a big part of that, whoever they do wind up bringing in. So you want to get them on board in the first place. Now, and then you want to get them on board and figure out, hey, what exactly are we going to be doing with you? How are we going to use you to the best of your abilities? And how are we going to use you in a way that takes our offense to the next level? I think that's really on the staff's mind pretty heavily right now. And that clock is ticking loudly. If, if the goal is to get a guy on campus for that early stage of January, get him yeah. that early acclimation. We've seen that payoff in a big way for guys in the past. Uh, you know, Mitchell Tinsley was ready to roll and, and work his way into that starting role by the time they were in preseason camp because of what he was able to accomplish with Sean Clifford and with this offensive unit through spring ball, uh, through things that were beyond the practice facility with him just being around campus. The year before that, Arnold Abikede, he credited a lot of what he accomplished that season as a first-team All-Big Ten pick at defensive end for all the investment that Penn State put into him in that first semester and the way it changed his body, the way it changed his ability to attack opponents. Um, and, and there's cases where, you know, maybe it doesn't necessarily work. John Lovett, uh, running back from Baylor, was the first guy to commit a couple of years ago in their recruiting class. He was on campus in January. His role ultimately fizzled out that upcoming season. And this past year, only Tinsley was was here in January. Hunter Norzat, who ended up starting seven games at guard, he got to campus later on. He didn't practice until August. The same goes for Chop Robinson, who was essentially a starter for this defense in his first season. Uh, but clearly, uh, that, that clock ticks louder and louder day by day if you're the coaching staff. And cornerback, Tyler, is another spot that, that has been clearly an emphasis since that portal window opened last Monday. What do we got cooking there at this point? I'd say Gavin Holmes from Wake Forest is the name to know at this point. Things have progressed pretty nicely there for Penn State. The thing with Holmes is he's making an official to Texas this weekend, and you don't know how that's going to play out. There's a, a good chance he could go down to Austin and say, well, hey, look, this is the place for me, and then he winds up never making it to Penn State. But if he goes through that visit without a commitment to the Longhorns, I would say it's looking like there's a pretty good shot that he makes it to Happy Valley at some point once 2023 begins. So a player Penn State likes, easy to see why. We talked about it a little bit the last time I was on. Really strong cover corner, length, good ball skills, just 
a, a potential impact player in the secondary, I think. And there's a reason Penn State's going after him as hard as they are and why they'd like to get him on campus in January. So another one we'll be monitoring this weekend. You know, not everything we'll be looking at this weekend is going down on Penn State's campus, and that visit is one of them. So we'll be keeping an eye on what goes on with Holmes while he's in Texas. We'll put some attention down this weekend uh, to the Sunshine State, where St. Thomas Aquinas will be seeking its latest state championship. It feels like they're there every single year. Conrad Hussey, King Mack are, are prominent members of that St. Thomas Aquinas team. They're also prominent members of this Penn State recruiting class. But Conrad Hussey, as we discussed earlier this week, was in Tallahassee last weekend, took an official visit to Florida State. We're inching our way towards signing day. What's the latest on the four-star defensive back? A lot going on there, man. You know, we talked about the idea of Miami being involved and him potentially making it to Miami for an official this weekend. Now it looks like it's not going to be Miami getting that official. All the signs are pointing towards Colorado kind of coming in out of nowhere and getting that official. And, you know, I say out of nowhere, like that's not what Colorado has been doing ever since Deion Sanders got hired. But, I mean, you know, with Hussey, this is a new development. It looks like he's going to be waking, excuse me, making his way out there with a uh, – St. Thomas Aquinas, a tinge. I believe it's three guys that are heading out there. So it's a nice little Florida contingent heading out to Boulder. Hussey's going to be among them. And I think there is, you know, at this point, there's probably a little bit of a reason, maybe not even a little bit. I think there's definitely a reason to be worried about Hussey. And I, I know Penn State feels that they can still keep him, and there's still plenty of confidence on that end. But when a kid's making visits and he's making the rounds and he's hearing all these different pitches, you can't help but worry. That's just – it's human nature, right? I mean, you had a guy committed for this long and he's still hearing out other programs so close to the early signing period. You kind of just have to hope for the best. And Penn State is going to get one last crack at him in person checking in on that St. Thomas Aquinas title game. They're going to check in with King Mac too, obviously, who's a very big part of that class. But Hussey, yeah, that's going to be their essentially their last chance with him before the early signing period. So another situation we'll be keeping a really close eye on, a lot going on there. Penn State's just going to have to hope that they can hang on to him. They've been doing everything in their power to make that happen, that's for sure. As you noted in your coverage this morning up in the site, James Franklin's gone in home with him. Uh, the staff will have a presence for this state championship game. Uh, he's got a fellow commit in his own locker room, in his own high school. Um, and, of course, all this time we talk about it's Florida recruiting, it's Florida recruiting. Watch out for those big three down there. And this last weekend before signing day, is he going to get on a plane and bring his skis and go up to Colorado? It, it's, it's just fascinating. The one thing I'll say about Colorado here, and what is brewing this weekend? If this is the weekend where you want to feel like a priority, good luck. Yeah. I just don't know how Coach Prime and his staff that he has just assembled can make anyone feel like they are, you know, the, the bell of the ball or, or you know, a, a, good luck. I mean, he's got a lot of charisma and I'm, I'm sure they are going to pull a lot of strings this weekend uh, and have a lot of plans. And he's had a lot of promises and guys are getting on planes from all over the country but I just get a sense that he spent some time at Penn State. He's been up there in some different situations. I think he got that family vibe. I just don't know how much of that he's going to pick up on Colorado. I understand why guys are going to be drawn to it. I'm very curious how some of these prospects who spend 48 hours in Boulder with this palooza of a situation digest it and come into Monday, Tuesday, and then signing day, Wednesday, how they feel about what they experienced and whether they want to commit to that long term. It's just a, a complete wrench that's been thrown into the recruiting universe here at the last second with, with Deion Sanders jumping up to the Power 5 football ranks and seeing that mess with Penn State situation just a little bit uh, is, is quite fascinating. Tyler, turning our attention uh, and keeping it at the high school level now, uh, running back remains a need for this class. We've talked about it a lot. London Montgomery was lost for his senior season with an injury. Two fantastic sophomores due back next year at that position, but they need some depth. Kevon Lee, we'll see where he is, but clock's ticking on his eligibility. Who is the name? Is it still the guy found in the Peach State? I would say it is. Penn State staff dropped in on Cameron Wallace recently, and that visit went really well. Kind of just reestablished Penn State as the top dog in that recruitment. He's still going to make it to Georgia Tech this weekend. I think it's kind of a KV on Key situation where, yeah, he's going to make that visit, and yeah, that program has been pushing hard, but I'm not really sure it's going to move the needle all that much. I feel like Penn State is pretty head and shoulders above the pack when it comes to Wallace, and I'm nearing a crystal ball. I just want to make one more call, see where things are at there. But, I mean, for the last, pretty much since the official visit, it's been nothing but positive vibes in Penn State's favor, and that's kind of picked up now as December's underway. And then, you know, the staff gets down there to check in on him, and just another really great visit where he just loves what the staff is saying, and he loves their relationship with them. So Wallace is definitely the name to know at running back right now. A lot of, lot of good things going on there. 
Tyler, you are such a tease. And since you are the one who brought up your crystal ball perspective, you made a pick last week for KV on keys. Mm -hmm. He just brought him up. He went down to Virginia tech. Uh, he's further removed from that visit at this point. He doesn't have much longer to dwell on this decision. It feels like he's been chewing hard on this one for about a year now. And Penn state's been involved for the entirety. How you feeling confidence wise? You know, he doesn't have much time left to dwell on that decision. You're right. And I don't think he's going to take too much more time to dwell on that decision. So he's been closing in on one pretty much for the entire week. And I think we're kind of getting to the point where he's getting close to being ready to roll. I'm still feeling pretty good about the crystal ball pick. Penn State has really differentiated itself in that recruitment. You know, just the efforts of the staff. Big reason why he wanted to move off that North Carolina commitment in the first place. And they've been a mainstay throughout his process, man. They haven't taken their foot off the gas at all. So Staff has done a lot of good work there, and I like where my crystal ball's at. I think the Penn State staff has done enough to make that prediction come true. The Penn State opened this week by adding Joseph Mapoye, Mason Robinson to their future edge rusher plans. A couple pickups there. A KV on Keys come on board. That could be a major boost to this defensive class. The last name, and maybe be that cherry on top you could qualify it as, is Daniel Harris, who was a Georgia commit. Georgia's still right there in the conversation. This tug of war, is there any definitive edge as we are now under a week away from him presumably putting pen to paper? <sighs> definitive? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't think definitive is a word I could use to describe this recruitment at, at any point. <laughs> There's just been so much back and forth. I will say that I do think Georgia still holds the slight edge, but as we've seen pretty much countless times at this point, that could change, you know, within six hours from now. We're just going to have to keep an eye on it and see. I like Georgia right now. This is a decision that's going to get made during the early signing period. I wouldn't anticipate one coming before that. I think he's going to take his time. I think, you know, the family needs to get aligned. I, I think they all kind of need to get on the same page there and figure out what the best option for Daniel really is. I mean, he's a heck of a player, man. You've seen the Joy Porter Jr. cops. He's a good player. He's a really good football player. There's a reason Georgia and Penn State – are so eager to add him to their recruiting classes. So this is going to be one that goes down to the wire. So <laughs> I keep saying it, but we're, we're going to keep an eye on it, man. Yeah, and we keep saying down to the wire. The wire is like right in front of our nose now. I know. We, you know, th there's crazy. not a lot of room to hide anymore in, in terms of making these decisions. And Daniel Harris, a four-star uh, cornerback out of Gulliver Prep down there in the Miami area, another <laughs> Florida prospect to monitor here in the final days. Tyler, appreciate the coverage. Uh, I'm sure that you have a ton of content coming up on the site, lions247.com, in the coming days as things break, if commitments do come in, transfer portal, winds blowing, a lot of stuff. I hope people are, are, are following it uh and we appreciate hopping on the podcast with us a couple times this week yeah of course before i go real quick gavin holmes yeah. official visit january 6th boom break there breaking news here on the podcast although now it'll, it'll be up in about two hours so i'll go <laughs> let you break it up on the message board thank you my friend of course all right take care uh, good stuff from Tyler Calvaruzzo, as always. Steve Bartle before him, breaking down this Rose Bowl matchup uh, for Utah and Penn State. And then prior to that, we started things off with the incoming quarterback, Jackson Smolik, out of Iowa. In just a matter of weeks, he'll be joining us here in Happy Valley. So a lot for you to listen to here on an episode of the Lions 24-7 podcast. Next week, we turn our attention to signing day. Uh, that will be on Wednesday. We're also coming out of Penn State Bowl Media Day here locally Friday morning into the early afternoon. We are back in the Beaver Stadium press room. We'll get James Franklin. We'll get Manny Diaz, Mike Yersich, a bunch of players. And we have a complete list of those players who are going to be available at Media Day up at lines247.com. Mark Brennan put together a story and had some interesting notes there and in what the indication might be. Last year, all the players who were available for Bull Media Day played or participated or showed up to Tampa and did not opt out is where I'm getting at. In this case, there's a lot of names that you like to see on that list. No surprising absences. And so it looks like this team could stay together intact uh, for what shapes up as a really exciting matchup out in Pasadena. Uh, along the way, we're with you here in the Lions 24-7 uh, podcast on the site. Stepping away for now, I am Tyler Donahue. Thanks to all of our team for hopping on and giving their insight throughout this episode. We'll talk to you real soon. Take care.